Okay, so Heroes and Tech is a platform um, dedicated to closing the gender gap between women and technology. Um, we offer several non-coding courses such as business analysis, data analytics, data governance, product design, bioinformatics, amongst others. Um, a little bit about our founder, Bisola Labi. Um, she started her career in tech over a decade ago and she's never touched the line of code. However, she witnessed a gap between women and technology. And so she decided to do something about it by coming up with a platform, which is Heels and Tech, where women who have somewhat become breadwinners can acquire non-coding technical skills and qualify for, you know, apply and qualify for quality jobs. Um, so far, the result has been phenomenal. And we're committed to doing more as we have also noticed even men coming to acquire these non-coding technical skills and, you know, via our platform. We are a fully online platform. We've trained from 22 countries and this has been made possible by the virtue of hands-on training and, you know, quality facilitators that we have who also help to ensure that our students get value and, you know, mentor them for interviews. Um, we've also trained students from various backgrounds, such as stay-at-home moms, undergraduates, professionals, and even people that wish to immigrate, you know, amongst others. Our aim for 2030 is to have trained over 100 million African women through paid and free sessions such as this. Um, here is some of the companies that our students work at. Um, this evening, we thought we have a guest that will be speaking to us concerning the no code options in the cybersecurity industry. She goes by the name Chikodi Ude, Chikodili Ude. Um, Chikodili Ude is a cybersecurity consultant. She's a published author, mentor, and entrepreneur with a decade experience in technology. She's also the co-founder and executive director of Hacktails, which is a cybersecurity academy dedicated to raising the next generation of cybersecurity professionals. She believes youth across Africa have untapped potentials which can be harnessed to bridge the global security talent gap through strategic partnerships and leaderships. So without wasting much time, I would like to introduce Ms. Chikadili Udele Ude to take the floor. Hey, good evening, everyone. I hope that I'm audible enough. Yes, please, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. All right. Good evening. Thank you for having me. Good today. evening. It's indeed an opportunity to be here. Um, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be able to speak with everyone on the call today. Okay, so um, as you've heard, my name is Chika Dilude. I am co-founder of Hacktails. And one of the things that I absolutely love doing is getting people enlightened about the career prospects that exist in the industry. As somebody who has been consulting for well over a decade, um, time and time again, I see that opportunities exist across board but it's almost like people are just not aware that these opportunities actually do exist. And it's like there's room for growth, there's room for career opportunities, but people are just not aware. And today I'm gonna to be shedding a lot of light on concepts that would help people get accustomed to the cybersecurity industry. Okay, please, can I have my slides so that we can start? Oh, you can't see me yet. All right, I'm going to be turning on my camera shortly. I thought it was turned on. Apologies for that. Am I audible now? Okay, so um, I've had quite a couple of events today. Uh, and this is my final event for the day. So great to have all of us here. Okay, so um, can we please have my screen, my slides so that we can proceed? I'm not sure. I can't see the screen yet. Okay, amazing. 
Thank you for that. So today we're going to be talking about no code options in the cybersecurity industry. And this is very important because one of the questions that a lot of people talk about is, oh, I do not know. I want to do cybersecurity, but I don't want to code. I want to do cybersecurity, but I don't know where to start from. Um, I want to do cybersecurity, but I'm not very technical. And those are just myths that exist in the industry. Um, and today we're going to be deciphering some of those things. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's. So what we're going to be talking about will be the cybersecurity industry. So starting with that, what is the cybersecurity buzz, right? Why why is everybody talking about cybersecurity? When you probably Google the top ten careers that exist in the industry, you're going to find that a lot of people are going to be talking about oh, cybersecurity is a path that exists, and cybersecurity is a path that exists, and um. Why, why is everybody talking about it at this point? Next slide, please. Now, one of the reasons that people are talking about cybersecurity, number one, if you look at the headlines that we have nowadays, you'd find that a lot of people are getting hacked. There are so many attacks that are happening across the board within multiple industries, be it finance, telcos, healthcare, you name it. There's so many different types of attacks every single day online and so it's very important now for businesses because everybody has gone digital before now if you had to go to the bank for if you had to transact you would need to go to the bank right you would need to get into the banking hall and talk to your banker and try to find out what is going on maybe make your transaction and all of that now it's very different all you need to do is log into your app and you can do the different kind of things transfer money across multiple regions, um, set up your KYC, everything is now digital. So that simply means that I don't have to have it. If I wanted to rob you, I wouldn't go get a gun to rob you. I would simply find a way to get into your... I'll simply find I'll a way to get into your... Can you hear me? It's echoing. I'm not sure where that noise is coming from. Can I go ahead, please? Yes, you can. Yes, you can go ahead. All right. I'll simply find a way to get into your devices and then I can wreck my havoc from there. So nowadays, it has become more pertinent that everyone gets accustomed to protecting themselves online. Every type of business. It's no longer just finance. Every type of business. Oil and gas, healthcare, manufacturing, you name it. Everyone has to think about protecting themselves now. Now, beyond that, um, it has now drawn the need for cybersecurity professionals across multiple industries. And if you look at the top right slide you see something in circles right different circles and this just speaks to what we call the global talent gap now the global talent gap is across multiple countries across multiple regions there is a need for talents um africa is not here largely because we are we do not have a lot of data to represent the true state of things but if you look at the arrow and highlighted yellow you find that if you look at Africa, the number of cybersecurity professionals in Nigeria as of 2023 stood at 8,000. So we have barely, we don't even have about 10,000 cybersecurity professionals in Nigeria. Bearing in mind that um, when the new Nigerian data protection law was passed into bill by the new president, Mohammed, uh, <laughs> President Tinubu, right? Um, basically, it was clear that currently we have over... 400,000 organizations, right? Well over that. And every organization is supposed to have a data protection officer. And we have barely 500 data protection officers in the country. So that means that if we were to take one organization, one data protection officer per organization, we have need for over 390 something thousand professionals for data protection. That is on one hand. On one hand. Um, and now look at the number of professionals across board. Now, if you look at South Africa, they recorded 57,000. When you think about our population, and think about the population of South Africans and the businesses that Nigerians have vis-a-vis -vis South Africans, you find that there's a gross lack of cybersecurity professionals in Nigeria. And if you look at the U.S., they have close to 500,000 cybersecurity professionals. That's a far cry from what we have in this region. So across Africa, there's this serious need for talent. Um, and if you even look at the other regions, Europe, 
Middle East and Africa and um, the other regions, Latin America, North America, there's tal there's need for talent everywhere. Um, and in if we if we keep saying there's need for talent, but nobody is doing anything about it, we're not going to move forward as a region. We're not going to move forward as a as an industry. And that is why there's there's more or less like a call. More people need to get into the industry. Um, and then of course the next question for anybody would be. Now that I know that there's a need, now that I know that there's an opportunity, how do I get my feet in the door? How do I start? Because despite the fact that people would say, you know, most of the roles out there require experience, some level of experience. The truth of the matter is that if you don't start now, two years from now, nothing is going to change. So I always employ everyone that I speak with that now is a good time to get started. Now is a good time to start learning the ropes. So that um, one year from now, you are way more skilled than you were when you started. And it's easier for you to now go after those jobs that are out there. All right, next slide, please. So now getting in, one of the things that a lot of people miss out is that the cybersecurity industry is segmented, very well segmented. Um, when I started out my career, right, it was like open testing, ethical hacking. That was everybody's dream. But get, getting in and starting work and starting to work in the industry, it now dawned on me that you know there are so many parts. And the fact that everybody believes it's pen testing and ethical hacking that is the only field makes a lot of non-technical people or people who have little or no technical background to feel a certain way, feel like, oh, you know, I can't do this, it's too technical. And that's not the case because there are different angles. So now if you look at the image, you find that the first, the first um the left side of the arc speaks to human, organizational, and regulatory aspects. Now, this aspect focuses on things like risk management, human factors, privacy and online rights, law and regulation. These are areas that are not very technical. Now, you must learn the basics for any career path. However, these are areas that anybody without a very strong technical background can do well in. If you look at risk and governance, it's really just going to, it's really just speaking to understanding risk frameworks and understanding how to apply them. So roles like governance, roles like risk, roles like compliance fall under the human, organizational, and regulatory aspect. If you're a lawyer, for instance, and you're thinking to yourself, oh, what area of law can I thrive in? This is one of the areas where I see a lot of lawyers thriving. So many lawyers I, I have mentored, and today they are doing amazing in the field of GRC. If you're someone who genuinely are a people person, you're an operations person, you love to teach, you love to you know, educate, something like what I'm doing now, human factors, you will thrive in that area. If you're somebody who looks at online rights, the rights of individuals, rights of children, you would also thrive in privacy and online rights. So these areas are really focused around law and people. So think of it as, in cybersecurity, we have three core areas, people, process, and technology. This human regulation, regulatory and organizational aspect is heavily focused on the people and process side of things. So if your career path is focused around people and process, we will definitely thrive well in this area of cybersecurity. Now let's move over to the right act. The right act speaks to attack and defenses. This is what everybody knows cybersecurity to be. Ethical hacking, forensics, uh, security operations. These areas are focused on attacks and defenses. So there are so many career paths that exist, right, within this area. Um, but the goal is that the, who, the kind of person that will do this career is somebody who is very technical savvy, because this area requires you to be very, you know, deep into the technical side of things. And then we have the middle. If you look at the middle, it's consisting of three different parts. Now, the entire middle is what we refer to as blue team, right? The blue teamers are people who focus on implementing solutions for defense. Now, the attacks and defenses side of things is what we call red team. That's the right arc, right? Red team in the sense that their job is to protect the organization from the perspective of being an ethical hacker. So they are more or less like people who hack an organization, but having your own inside attacker. So the person is not hacking to take down the organization. The person is hacking to show the blue team the loopholes they need to fix. And that's the difference, right? So one side is attacking, one side is defending. So the right side on the, of the arc focus on attacking, while the, the curves inside focus on defending. Now, the entire curves inside is focused on defense. But as you can see, defense is also split into different areas because you can't defend everything right there are, there, are, there are specialties so if you look at the blue app the blue circle is focused on systems operating systems um cryptography network systems 
those are the areas that is focused on. So you hear things like endpoint security engineer, um, system engineer. Those people focus on building defensive systems for companies. On the, the red arc, is focused on infrastructure. So these people are heavily focused on physical and network security. Because if you think about infrastructure, digital infrastructure, you know, those your servers, your databases, all those kind of architecture, these engineers focus on putting measures in place to defend them. So things like your firewall, they'll be very good with fire, implementing firewalls and all those kind of solutions. And then we have the software and platform security. So if you are somebody who already has a good command of applications, maybe for instance, you're a developer um, or you're a DevOps guy, you can definitely thrive in this area because again, it's focused on software and platform security. So these are the areas in which cybersecurity is focused on. And these five core areas, there are so many roles that exist in those five core areas. The goal today is just to introduce you to these things. You can always go back and read about them because I will be exposing you in the next slide to the frameworks that guide this, these particular five core areas that I've spoken about. Next slide, please. So now in the cybersecurity industry, there's something we call the NICE framework. And everything I've talked about, the five core areas I've talked about is further broken down into so many other career paths within the NICE framework. So if you Google the NICE framework, you would you have a full-blown PDF that breaks it down even further. And I also have a, a video on YouTube on Hacktails TV that you know talks about this extensively. So you can easily just check that out. Um, so now if you look at the NICE framework, what is the NICE framework? Essentially, the NICE framework takes those five core career paths and breaks it down into seven core areas. So you look at the, if you look at the left side of the screen, you'll see that we have seven core areas, which is analyze. Analyze are people that look at trends. They study logs. You'll find that people that work in like security operations, SOC analysts, they fall under analyze. We have collect and operate. SOC may also fall under collect and operate, depending on the areas that they are working in. Um, we have investigate. These are the forensics guys. The the criminal forensics, the people who look at, you know, they investigate issues and try to nip it in the board. We have the operator maintain. Think of operator and maintain as your regular IT support guys. But now these IT support guys are supporting cybersecurity tools and products. We also have oversee and govern, more or less like your GRC, um, more or less like your cybersecurity officers. These are people that managerial position, more or less, that's oversee and govern cybersecurity teams. Then we have protect and defend. Think of protect and defend as your blue team. And then we have securely provision. Securely provision are people that, you know, they provision different types of tools. So if you're an organization, if you're an engineer now, a cloud security engineer, your job will be to provision labs, provision VMs, provision software, provision different things in a secure way so that everyone in the organization can thrive. So these are the core areas that is focused on. These are the structures. These are the categories. Now, under those categories, we now have something we call specialty area, um, which now breaks down those roles into certain specialties. For instance, I would say oversee and govern now. You can be a trainer. You can be a GRC analyst. You can be multiple roles under oversee and govern. So the framework now even breaks down the seven categories. It now breaks it down into seven, 32 specialty areas, which is further broken down into 52 work roles. What that means is that within cybersecurity, you have over now it has even because this is an is an old framework. Um, you know, more roles have come up as technology continues to evolve. For instance, you won't see anything like cloud security in that framework, but it doesn't mean that cloud security doesn't exist. But the reason I always reference this framework is so that new entrants into cybersecurity can understand the bedrock of how cybersecurity roles come up. There's a standard. If you check that document, you'll find that each work role is now broken down into the tasks you'll be doing in that work role, the knowledge needed for that work role, the skills needed for that work role, and the abilities needed for that work role. So what then, what I always, you know, speak to everyone about is go through the document, the nice framework, read it, look at all the tasks, bring out, write them out, look at all the skills, write them out, and then use it to build like your own personal KPI. So that way, you now know that, okay, if I want to get a job one year from now as a cybersecurity analyst, what are all the skills I need? You would now see the oh, ability to, net, to, to understand networking protocols, ability to do X, ability to do Y. And now you now know all the things any interviewer is going to ask you. And then you can prepare yourself accordingly. So that is what the framework is about. This is just a high-level explanation of the framework. The framework is available online. Once you Google nice framework cybersecurity, you would find so many PDFs on 
this framework that really elaborates what this person, what these job roles are and breaks it down for you. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, now, how do you make the best choice? Because that is something that everyone always wants to you know, find out. How do you make the best choice? Now, there's so many roles, right? I've talked about different areas, different categories. But the reality is that to make the best choice, you have to know who you are at your core. I find that a lot of young people, you know, they just want to go where the wind blows. Everybody says, today is DevSecOps, you start learning DevSecOps. Tomorrow is uh, hacking, you start learning hacking. Next tomorrow is coding, you start learning coding. And that is not a bad thing because it's, I, I personally feel like you can try as much as possible. I did so many things. At some point, I started I was coding because, you know, my, my, my career and forced me to code at some point. But I realized that it wasn't really my thing. I understand programming because, again, something I've done for a period, but I, do, I knew I wasn't, I I wasn't going to make a career out of that path. At some point, I was designing graphics. I'm actually an excellent graphic designer as of today. But it's not something I'm, I wanted to make a career out of. It's just something I tried and I liked and I took, you know, I, did, I just learned it because I felt like it was going to be an added skill. So I have no problem with learning multiple things. However, you need to realize that you can't make a career out of everything which is why you have to know yourself and where your strength lies. Now, in terms of personalities, there are different types, which are six major personalities. You can be a realistic person. I remember when I started out in tech, I used to tell my dad I would want to work as a network engineer because I wanted to install microwaves. You see all those very tall masks you see that have micro dishes on them. I wanted to install those things. And that was because uh, at my core, I felt like, oh, I wanted to do something very hands-on, and that was the only thing I could do that was hands-on, or that was what my mind could perform was hands-on at a point in time. And the reality is that um, there's more to life than, you know, climbing dishes. And even today, thinking back, it's so funny that I, I thought that that was going to be a full-blown career path for me, <laughs> considering how, how scared I am of height right now. So yeah, but the goal is that I'm someone who loves to use my hands. I'm someone who loves to try out things. I, would, I was that child that would just break my toys to see what was in it. I was that child that if you tell me, oh, this thing is fault, I would truly want to break it apart and try to see what I can do with it. And of course, I knew from a very young age that I wanted a hands-on practical kind of job, which is why I do what I do today, right? I'm a network security engineer. Uh, and then that's for the realistic kind of personality. We also have conventional. These are people who are structured, organized, and careful. They like process. They are process driven. So people that are conventional at, at their core we tend to enjoy things like GRC because GRC is just a set of frameworks and your job is to go and tell the organization oh we need to comply or we must comply to these things and give them all the steps necessary and start tracking everything you are not compliant here you are compliant here oh we need to change this we don't have a process for this we don't have a process for that people who are conventional are process driven they like to go by the books they like to go by step by step as to everything so somebody who is realistic will find that kind of job very boring however somebody who is conventional will find you know the realistic kind of job too much too exhausting so it's very important that you understand yourself now we also have investigative these are people who are research oriented i personally love research at some point i was doing hacking and i loved it but i realized that i didn't want to do it for the long term so i left it um but if you i, I know some other people if you tell them oh this thing is not working they will get frustrated they don't even know what to do next they'll start looking at you like ah, okay what do we do now those kind of people are not investigative in nature. They are not extremely curious in nature. So if you are that kind of person, you can't thrive in ethical hacking because ethical hacking requires you to be the, that person that would go and probe things and find things that nobody else is seeing. So it's very important to know that. So somebody asks, what is GRC? GRC means governance, risk, and compliance. I mentioned it earlier. Governance, risk, and compliance. is a type of role under your human regulatory and organizational aspects. So it consists of so many roles, but the popular name today is GRC or the short name today is GRC. So you have risk careers under that. You have compliance careers under that. All right, then we have the artistic people, people who are expressive, creative, and visual. And this goes to people who may not necessarily have a technical background, but also want to thrive in cybersecurity. We have technical writers. We have content creators for cybersecurity. Yes, they exist. We have uh, media personalities for um cyber security we have trainers people who would come up with amazing designs for training content these are all different types of careers that exist but again 
if you are not looking, you may not necessarily see that those careers actually exist. So those are the artistic type. If you're the artistic type, it doesn't mean that there's no room for you. There's plenty of room for you. You just need to find your niche and key into it. Then we have the social butterflies. These are people who are people, people, people persons, right? They love people. They love to deal with people. You, you, could, be, you could do so many roles. You could be a project manager for cybersecurity. You could be a, pro, a product manager. You could be a cybersecurity operations manager. You could be a lot of things because there are so many career paths that are tied to people and process within cybersecurity. You could thrive in that area. And finally, we have the enterprising. These are people who are sociable, who are entrepreneurs at their core. And in cybersecurity, this is one many people don't know, which is called sales engineering. Um, sales engineering is a type of role in cybersecurity where you literally sell cybersecurity products. As a matter of fact, they even earn more than the average cybersecurity engineers. And you know why? Because they are the ones that bring the money to the organization. So they earn a salary, they also earn commissions. And they thrive very well in that career path. Currently, I, I, I work in a sales capacity as well. So realistically, see that there's room for you across board. And I've seen so many people transition from selling. I know personally somebody who was selling drugs. And when I mean drugs, not like, <laughs> not drugs, but like medicine, right? He works for a pharmaceutical company. And today, he's, he sells cybersecurity. So you can transition from any field. What is important is that you understand the fundamentals that drive that industry. Once you can do that, it's easy to bring your transferable skills from your other industries into the field of cybersecurity. All right, so moving on. Sorry, next sorry, slide, sorry, to, sorry to cut you off. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, sorry, could you buttress more on how you can sell cybersecurity, if you don't mind? Okay, so to, to buttress on how you can sell cybersecurity, um, Cybersecurity is an emerging field, right? And in a, in a situation like um, that we have today in today's world, very few organizations actually know what they need to buy and what they need to do. So the job of a salesperson is to go to every organization and knock on doors and enlighten them. Oh, so you know, what do you use for your endpoint? What do you use for your networks? What do you use for this? And then they start talking. Oh, we don't do anything for this. So, oh, why are you not doing that? Okay, you know what? Let's come and do a demo for you. Or let's come and do a proof of concept for you. So one of the things that I do is to, you know, do like a phishing simulation in the environment. And sometimes you find that many of them will now realize that, oh my God, our staff actually have no knowledge of cybersecurity. Now they are worried because you, you do a phishing test for their organization. Some of their staff, 90% of them will give you information about the company. And I, sometimes you even see people send, there was a particular time I did a phishing simulation and people were sending me tax documents because again, they didn't know that I wasn't actually a staff member. They didn't bother to even look at my, my, uh, the email, the domain that the mail was coming from. They just felt like, oh, this is my normal colleague and sent it. And then when I showed the organization the data, they were shocked. Like, oh, we definitely need to start doing trainings. We definitely need to start putting security in place. Sometimes you do POCs, you get a firewall in there, and they start to see that, oh, 90% of their traffic is people just browsing Facebook on the, on the office dime. So these are some of the things that we do just to ensure that they now say that, okay, there's so much loophole within their organization. And that way, once you find those loopholes, you start to sell products to them. And that is from a case of you finding opportunities. If you think about it from a compliance perspective, for instance, the banks, they must comply to certain standards by CBN, by NIBS. So whether they like it or not, every year they must invest in certain tools to protect themselves. So your job as a salesperson is to go meet those organizations, show them the different technologies that can do those things and get them to buy one of them. I hope that helps you um, with a bit of understanding. Yes, it does. Thank you. Absolutely. And these tools are very expensive. So more often than not, you find that most of these tools cost upward of $100,000. So if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if your percentage on it is 5%, which is the average percentage in the industry, you know how much you're taking home at the end of every month if you make a sale. So it's a very interesting career path that not many people are actually aware of. Every day, people reach out to me, Ochikadi, do you have sales engineers for me now? The ones that I'm able to groom, I give, out, I give them out to people. But there's always need for these people because a lot of consulting organizations, they need to scale, they need to grow, they need people, but people just don't know that these things exist. So yeah, career outlook, 2024 and beyond. What roles are organizations looking for? Now, according to Fortinet, roles that organizations are looking for mostly in today's world are 
cloud security specialist. With everybody going cloud now, before now, you know, a lot of people used to have their servers and all of their infrastructure sitting in their office. But today, nobody is buying servers for hundred thousand dollars anymore. Now people are just using AWS, Azure, uh, Oracle Cloud. They are using all those things because you can spin up your environment and do things faster. So of course, everybody's looking for cloud security architects. So cloud security architects are people who understand cloud architecture and they now understand the security aspect of it. So that way, they know that, okay, once we have this person in the organization, anything we're doing, there's a full-blown organizational network on the cloud. And this person is responsible for ensuring that we have no loopholes. So you have a developer in Germany, you have a developer in Nigeria, all of them are connecting to the same infrastructure. Somebody is responsible for setting up all the access controls. That is the job of a cloud security architect. So organizations more and more are looking for people like this out there. You also have the likes of security operations analysts. These people are responsible for, for instance, CBN, <clears throat> your banks. There are people that sit down at the SOC and the people's job is to actually take cognizance of when there's any attack or any indicator of compromise in the environment. So these people know how to use tools like your SIM. So a SIM is a security incident and event monitor. So what the SIM does is that if there's any breach, for instance, maybe as an organization, all your customers are Nigerians, and all of a sudden you start seeing heavy traffic from Iran. You need to look at those traffic. Okay, where's this IP coming from? Who's trying to attack us? You start blocking those IPs. That is what SOC analysts do. They figure out indicators of compromise, investigate it, and put in measures to block those things from attacking their infrastructure. Then we have security administrators. I don't need to say much about that. Think of your IT support, but they administer security solutions within the organization. We have security awareness and training administrators. This is funny because this is something a lot of people can do, but they're not even aware. A security awareness and training administrator is responsible for influencing positive security culture within the organization. So their job is to create trainings for teams, to run phishing simulations, to ensure that people are actually getting better when it comes to cyber security within the organization. Um, we have network architects, we have depth specialists, incident response specialists, plan specialists, penetration testers. These are all roles that are out there and people are looking to fill these roles. Organizations worldwide are looking to fill these roles across multiple countries. And the good thing about cybersecurity is that it's not like if you learn cybersecurity in Nigeria, we need to now learn a different type when you get to Europe or Germany or anywhere else. No, that's not how it works. It's a universal language. So if you know it, you can be, you can, you, you can be hired anywhere in the world. And then what are the hardest roles to fill? You can see on the other side, the ones that organizations truly struggle to fill. SOC, cloud security, network security, people that can deploy firewalls. But these are skills that not many people know how to use. And the reason for this is because a lot of people don't even know that these tools exist. And in the event that they know that they exist, these tools are expensive, so they are not easy to access. However, there's a lot of open source tools that you can start from learning those ones. Google, YouTube, I'm sure YouTube is a university on its own. So what's important is actually knowing that you can actually learn these things and to start doing your research. Oh, how do I become a compliance analyst? If that's what ties to your personality and you can start working towards that. So if you scan the barcode in the middle of the page, you find that I have an article that I wrote which talks about 10 different security parts that exist that, you know, some of them are not even listed here. So if you are interested in reading that, you can go there. That is a blog post that continues to help people. You can just read up on it. It will give you insight into um, some of the other career paths, like policy writers, technical writers, sales engineers. It breaks down some of those rules even better. So you can just take a minute to quickly scan that so you can read the blog posts on your own much later. Okay, so next slide, please. So now the next question would be, of course, now that I know that there's so much room and I know that opportunities are bound, how can I get started? It's very simple. Getting started is not even hard at all. Learn your basics. Get your basics right. What are the basics? Number one, networking. You can't say you want to be a cybersecurity expert and you don't even know how me, I sitting here now and presenting where I am, and you can see it from halfway across the world, wherever you are. There's a reason. There's a reason how, of how technology works, and that's where networking comes. Networking helps you understand the fundamental principles that information systems drive on. Because me talking to you somewhere, anywhere in the world, it's packets moving from destination to your destination and vice versa. So you need to really understand at your core 
how packets traverse the network. That's the process I come So having networking skills is so it's so valuable because anything you do in cybersecurity, you must know network. Even if you're a GRC analyst, because for you to even be able to do quality things, but there's a bit of background noise. Can we mute? Okay. So yeah, networking is very essential. Another thing you need to understand is operating systems. Um, and this is because most of the security tools thrive off one operating system or the other. It could be Windows, it could be Linux, it could be Unix, it could be Mac. You have to understand all the kind of operating systems that exist. That is how you can better protect them. Understand their file structures, understand how attackers clean up things, understand um, you know, the way files generally work and the way system files are saved, how they work, how to use the CLI. You may not necessarily know how to code because a lot of people ask that, oh, do I need to code? No. However, understanding basic you know, commands goes a long way to help you thrive in the industry. Then we also have system administration. This is important. You need to know how to administer systems, you know, how to install things, how to delete things, how to wipe systems. All those things are extremely important. How to investigate a log, how to decipher a hash, how to encrypt things. Those are key things that you need to know. And that's where the system administration comes in. And finally, cybersecurity frameworks. There are so many frameworks in cybersecurity, depending on the track that you have chosen. So if you choose to do GRC, there's the ISO 27001 framework. There are so many other frameworks that is standard across every country and every industry. Um, every industry has their own. For instance, in the healthcare, you have HIPAA. In the finance, you have uh, ISO 27001. You have NIST. Nice. There are so many different frameworks. So if you choose to go the red team, red team route, you have the certified ethical hacker frameworks. You have um, your SOC frameworks. You have different frameworks. It really just depends on Part, which is why it's important from the get-go that you know what you are trying to do and you know the career path you are trying to go into so that you don't keep learning so many things and then you are not even working towards anything. You're just learning everything and anything that is for you. are not driven towards a goal. You're not working towards a path. And that's where it comes in. So once you have these four fundamentals, it, be it, became, it, be it helps you to be a grounded professional and then you can build from then on. You can become employable such that you know the organization then allows you to start to grow from there. But if you don't have this fall on lockdown, it's going to be hard to show value to anybody. Next slide, please. So yeah, once you have mastered the basics, the next step is to validate your skills. And validating your skills in this case will mean that you need to show the employers that, yeah, indeed, I know these things, and somebody has vetted that I know these things. So there are different ways to validate your skills. There are so many trainings online, some free, some paid. It really just depends on what you are looking at. Again, which is why it's important to know the path you are working in. So that that way, you can focus on taking a training in line with what you are doing. One of the trainings I will always advise people to take is the CCNA training, um, as well as the, because Cisco has a lot of trainings, networking trainings that are free online. Right, it helps you just understand networking and some of those basics. So those are trainings that you can take and get a certificate for, and that way, you know, your CV is now starting to look fuller and fuller because you have value to sell to the next person. Okay, moving on to the next, and finally, join a community. If you've ever been to an one bed party, right, and <laughs> you go to you go to a party and maybe for, it's not somebody you know so well and you don't have anybody that you know, was invited along with you see how you just be at one corner of the table and you're just looking around and you're just like let's just finish and go home however if you go with your guys and your goons you just have such a swell time because again the community you have your community there and that's the same thing if you are not in a community you are going to struggle because 80 percent of jobs and related activities are not posted online especially when it comes to cybersecurity. And that's one thing that new entrants face. They say, oh, I don't see any job posting. I don't, because most of the time, the jobs are not posted. Every week, I get at least 10 people saying, oh, I need this role, I need that role. Those are not things I will post online. I will just reach out to my community and say, hey, who is interested? Well, you're sending me your CV. And then I forward it to those people. And just like that, people get jobs. But you're not going to see that posted online. So it's very important that you belong to a community. 
there's so many communities online. Um, Hackers has a community. We have the area of hackers. We have cyber girls. Follow a lot of cybersecurity professionals. Um, once you go on Twitter and Google cybersecurity, there's a full-blown cybersecurity community for Nigeria that you can be a part of. And from there, you start to see so many Nigerian cybersecurity professionals who can give you insights, who can mentor you, who can, by what they post, by opportunities they put out there, you just start to really understand how the industry works. And those are the three, those are my own three um, steps for getting started. Get your basics right, find one or two certifications that help you validate your skills, and join a community so that you can always apply for opportunities and you can be abreast of what the industry is looking for per time. Next slide, please. So yes, that will be all for now. I think we can leave the floor open for questions. Thank you, Ms. Shikadiri. Um, so I think now we can take some questions. So please, if you have any question, go ahead and ask. Hi, Chika Dili. This is um, Ejuma. Thank you so much for your time and the training. Um, so to, to become a cybersecurity analyst or to join um, the cybersecurity community or the or to get a job as a cybersecurity person, is it compulsory to do one of the certifications? Because I hear people say that you must have maybe CompTIA or whatever they call all those things for you to be able to get into the workforce. Is that true? Is that entirely true? Okay, so while it is not entirely true, it's, I won't say it's 100% true, but if I to gauge it on a scale of 1 to 100, I would say it's 40 or 50% true. It's half and half, and that depends on the number of factors. And when I started out my career, the competition wasn't as stiff as we have it today, because now a lot of people are getting more aware, and you know, organizations want to hire someone that has a bit of credibility. They don't just want to hire their bit. So, I mean, if you say, I know this thing, and they ask you a few questions, and you get it, that doesn't show much, right? So it really depends on the organization. There are organizations that will say, if we train, if we hear, if we hear from you, if we interview you, and we see you don't have education report, we can tell that you have track record. So the track record in this case will be maybe you you are on a platform like Try Hackney, and you can show that oh, you know, you have your streaks of things you've done. You can demonstrate your home lab and things that you are able to achieve. Yes, the person knows that okay, this person doesn't have a lot of funds to write certifications, but the person can see that indeed this person has put in the work. So if you will not have certifications to validate your skills. You must have something to show that truly you have experience. You must have, you know, your own set of skills that you can prove beyond reasonable doubt that show that you are actually employable. But the easy hack is is um certifications because the reason I would always say certifications, or I would say as much as possible, get one or two, is because many of the hiring or recruiters out there don't even know, you know, the difference in certifications and somebody that actually knows what they are doing. Most of the time, they will use certifications to vet. So if you don't have any certification, you find that it's hard to get your foot in the door, except you are going through somebody that recommends you. So what I would always advise is, while you have the skill, one of the certifications won't hurt, just so that it's easy to get your foot in the door. It's not compulsory, but it really does go a long way to help you get your foot in the door. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Hi, Faith, is there room for another question now? I have All right, please go ahead. Hello. Okay. Okay, so my question is this. For someone that has um, like a marketing background and wants to transition, um, which of the certifications do you think I can start with saying that I don't even have any idea about programming, networking, and um, the likes? And I would obviously want to start with um, um, the non-tech part of it. So, okay, like so, to all right, thank you. So I think that one of the first things would be to get accustomed to cybersecurity fundamentals so you can take a certification for instance like comtia a plus a plus you know starts from the very basic teaches you basics of it 
And after you're done with CompTIA Plus, you can now start to move gradually into networking and into security fundamentals. And the reason why I would always say networking, regardless of whether you have a technical background or not, is because the networking bit just exposes you to see truly how the internet works. Now, networking has made, you know, it has, it has a tears. There's, I mean, someone that is in network is um in market, coming from a background in marketing or law, doesn't need to now start configuring a network box, right? But you want to just understand the basics of how it works. So what I would always say is start with CompTIA A+, plus. it's basics of IT, then move your way into CompTIA N+, plus, which is CompTIA Network+. Plus. It's not like the Cisco Network+, plus, which is very detailed. The CompTIA Network+, plus is just high level. So it just teaches the basics of networks. And from there, you can now move into the security fundamentals, CompTIA Security+. Plus. So how do we get this CompTIA A+, plus? Also, oh, it's um Where? once you just go go to Comtia's website, C O M P T I A, they have a range of you'd find how to go about it. Okay, some people have their hands raised up. Um, can we have Kola Wale? Your hands have been up since. Yes. Good evening, um, Miss Chikodili. Thank you for the wonderful yeah. session. So um, I just completed um, the cyber guest training and I'm looking to give back to the cybersecurity community. So I don't know if use and tech or maybe your community is currently recruiting for volunteers. I would like to volunteer in any community right now. Okay, so amazing. So we can we can always have a conversation. Um, you can also reach out to use and tech. And we can take it up from there. Right? I mean, the industry needs people like you. So that would be very much welcome. Okay, thank you. That's all I needed to ask. Thank you. Thank you for... I thank could you reach for out to you on Twitter or LinkedIn. Anywhere, I'll, I'll definitely respond. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Okay, Yetunde, can we have your question? Um, yes, and um, go. Okay, Solomon Alabi, let's have yours. Okay, thank you. Good evening, everyone. And uh, evening. thank you to um, Chikodili for that fantastic presentation. Um, my question is, looking at your presentation, the aspect that talks about the, um, the realities, the entrepreneurship, the socialism and all, and uh, looking at my own kind of uh, personality and the area I would probably would love to delve into, I am more of a realist uh, person. And I would like to do advice, okay, what are the uh, courses or the areas that I should focus on? Because I, I, I love to have hands-on experience, have a bit of IT skills though. And uh, what are the platforms? Where would you advise that I could get such training? Okay, so um, in terms of hand, once you're a hands-on person, you can do well in either the blue team or the red team. So it really now depends on you. Are you someone that likes to, you know, just um, help create defensive technologies? Or do you want to be that guy that researches and finds bugs, finds issues with systems? Are you extremely great at research? Or are you more tilted towards, you know, taking, for instance, a, a set of processes and just implementing the way, for instance, Cisco says, oh, to implement our firewall, these are the steps. If you are the kind of guy that you know just wants to focus on, oh, these are the steps, implement it and troubleshoot if you face an issue. Great, you can do blue team. However, if you're the kind of person that is more, you know, you want to, you have a, an attacker's mindset, you would be most likely to towards red team. So those are the two major things you can do for somebody who has, you know, a hands-on personality. Okay. Hi, this is Yetunde. Can can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you so much. Chikodili, thank you. I'm sorry I joined a bit late. Um it's a busy morning for me. Um, thank you for the person. I think well, somebody had already even asked the question I wanted to ask. I am recently just finished them um, cyber security training. And like you said, we started with basics of cybersecurity, 
I've gone ahead to, you know, we've gone ahead to look at networking. There's a book on risk information management, you know, we are doing, and then of course the projects also working on in, you know, assessing, you know, risk in an organization, applicable controls to be applied, um, you know, coming up with a statement of, um, applicability and all of that and so of course my own question too was centered on or you know it's going to be centered on volunteering because i haven't done the exam the certification i also wanted to ask on what certification will you now um, suggest for somebody that just finished their training was the first or you say the first step the most important certification for a beginner which one okay. would you say okay start with this before you start moving up Yes. Okay, so I would always recommend Security Plus, and that's because it's globally recognized as a starting point. Home Security, Security Plus. Plus. Yes, okay. exactly. Security Plus is always your way to go because it, con it's, it really takes into cognizance all of the basics. So that way, anybody employing you knows that, okay, this person has a very good command of the basics of cyber security. Okay. Okay, so my question would be, you said, so is, this is a certification, the Pontia Security Plus, right? Yes. Okay, so how do we even assess this training? Um, once you go to the site, you see, so the way it is, the metric center exam. So that means that you would register online, then pick your okay. center, and then go write it. And we have the likes of New Horizon. There are a couple of companies that do training. So if you go, if you just Google Prometric centers in Nigeria, New Horizon is one that I'm, I'm very sure of. Um, they, they offer the training. So you don't even have to go through the hassle of... Um, you know, Googling it and trying to get dollars and all that, they would give you okay. the cost equivalent in Naira and you can just take it up from there. Okay, and people in maybe in the US or Canada can also access this. Um... Oh, yes, absolutely. So there are different prometric centers per region. Nigeria has a couple, every other region also have theirs. And some okay. of those exams you can actually write from the comfort of your home. It really just okay. depends on. on the kind of exam. There are some you can write from home. They will mandate that you go to a prometric center. There are some okay. that will tell you, you, know, you can write it from the comfort of your home, depending on your country. Most Nigerians, okay. they don't allow us writing from comfort of our home for obvious reasons. Okay. So like if you're in the US or in Canada, you might be able to write it you from home. You might be able to write it from home, yes. Okay. And for these certification exams, because for somebody that has done the training, you don't need to attend lectures again for it. You can just um, have the materials available that you can read to write the certification exams, or you still have to attend um, some form of um, classes. Oh, no. So it depends on you and your level of skill. By the time you go through the brochure and coursework, you'll be able to tell, oh, I understand this fully, or, ah, and I need some okay. help. So it depends on of um, skill and understanding. Okay. Thank you so much, Chikodili. So my next question will be to Ings and Tech. Um, like, you know, Chikodili has um, given us um, some resources. Please, is it going to be available on the WhatsApp group? Yes, we'll so that... be available. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Okay, so um, I would have to run now because it's pretty much seven. So please, for any of the questions, questions just we have. One. Okay, fine. Maybe we can just Thank answer you very one. much. Please. please, um, I just want to know if you, of you know a lot, but if you didn't know anything about cybersecurity, mm -hmm. if I didn't know anything about tech, and you wanted to step into a playground you have no idea about and you don't have the money to have to pay for a certificate yet what would be the first thing you would look for and when you go on YouTube because that would be like you know say you said YouTube is a university what would be the first thing you look for to help you cyber security fundamentals so um, what are the basics of cyber security there's so many free resources on cyber security fundamentals Dr. Mesa's has a couple, Dr. Messers, he really takes the security, comes here security plus and breaks it down step by step. He has so many videos and those videos I always recommend to new entrants. So he takes those concepts and discusses them because the whole idea is when you start to understand the concepts, you now start to see the possibilities that exist in that industry. So the first step will be, what, are, what is cybersecurity about? What are, the what are the basics that everybody must know? Another thing I would suggest is if you don't have one of those educations, Look out for 
free boot camps online. There are a couple of boot camps, remote internships. They're not going to pay you, obviously, but you know you can just join those boot camps and start to learn about basics of cybersecurity. From there, you find your feet. So you said Thank Dr. Mensa, Mensa, is it Mensa? Mensa, Mensa, M E S S E R. M E S E R, yes, Dr. Mensa. Thank you, Ma. All okay. right. So, um, Thank for you any so other much. questions, please, you can feel free to send your questions to News and Tech, and I will definitely, you know, I'll just send my responses via email so that at least you can still have those responses. Okay. Thank you so much, Ms. Jikadiri. We appreciate your time and your engagement today. It's made the webinar special and it was very insightful. Thank you all for joining. And as always, you can reach out to us uh, via our Instagram, our website, those of us that are already in the WhatsApp group are uh, alumni. You can reach out to us and ask any question and then we'll get back to you. All right. Thank you so Thank much you for the opportunity. Everyone.